And we are going to be talking today about Sidney Poitier. I think virtually everyone here knows who he was, an amazing uh, actor. Um, we're not going to be talking so much about the various films he did. They may come up now and then. Um, but we have three parts of his life that we're going to talk about. And the first one is about uh, his growing up on Cat Island in the Bahamas, an island that's 48 miles long and three miles wide, and uh, his connection to nature. So we have uh, a wonderful video um, of him talking about his uh, his life growing up uh, on Cat Island and what it meant to him. So here we go. During my earliest years, I was constantly exposed to, to nature. There were, for instance, no automobiles and no motorized vehicles at all, boats or, or trucks or cars. So the sounds that came to me when I was a boy were the sounds of the environment, were the sounds of insects singing and the sounds of water against the shore. But then when I went to places where there were cars and traffic and people, I began to realize the difference. I could walk on a beach for hours and hours by myself. I used to do that a lot. And I would listen to the sounds, all of which were natural sounds. There was a purity. Uh, there was a closeness to nature. I know that it was a most powerful influence on the rest of my life. I honor my spirit when I think of the core values of my parents. My father didn't define his core self by material things. He didn't. He loved us, and he cared for us, and he talked to us, and he nurtured us. My mother's spirit is always around me, always there, guiding me almost. I can sense it. I first felt that sense of connection with my parents on Cat Island, and I never lost that. My spirit is honored when I think of my connectedness to the universe. I feel I'm a part of everything. I'm a part of nature. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, video with us and uh, we will be reciting our affirmation in just a moment so if you will stay muted and uh, recite this with me what are we here for love is the doctrine of this community the quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve the needs of all beings to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with the source of our being. Thank you. And now we have a treat for you. Anne Marie has a story for us. Today's story comes from this lovely book called Gift from the Sea by Annie Morrow Lindbergh. She went to an island to take a little reprieve from the world and um, participate in the healing that the sea and the beach and the islands offer us. So this is one of her readings. This is a snail shell and it's round and full and glossy as a 
horse chestnut, she says. Comfortable and compact, it can sit curled up like a cat in the palm of your hand. Milky and opaque, it has the pinkish bloom of the sky on a summer evening, ripening to rain. On its smooth, symmetrical face is penciled with precision a perfect spiral. Winding inward to the pinpoint center of the shell, the tiny dark core of the apex, the pupil of the eye, it stares at me, this mysterious single eye, and I stare back. Now it is the moon, solitary in the sky, full and round, replete with power. Now it is the eye of a cat that brushes noiselessly through long grass at night. Now it is an island set in ever widening circles of waves, alone, self-contained, serene. How wonderful are islands, islands in space, like this one I have come to, ringed about by miles of water, linked by no bridges, no cables, no telephones. An island from the world and the world's life. Islands in time, like this short vacation of mine. The past and the future are cut off, only the present remains. Existence in the presence gives island living an extreme vividness and purity. One lives like a child or a saint in the immediacy of here and now. Every day, every act is an island, washed by time and space, and has an island's completion. People too become like islands in such an atmosphere, self-contained, whole and serene, respecting each other's solitude, not intruding on their shores, standing back in reverence before the miracle of another individual. Thank you. And now we'll have an introduction by Lynn Wolf to our next beautiful part. We're going to hear from the virtual choir a beautiful song by Harry Belafonte. And he found this song when he was in Africa. He was in a country called Guinea. And as he says it, I went deep into the interior of the country and in a little village, I met with a storyteller. That storyteller went way back in African tradition and African mythology and began to tell this story about the fire, the sun, the water, the earth. He pointed out the whole of these things put together turns the world around. That all of us here, all of us are here for a very, very short time. And in that time that we're here, there really isn't any difference in all of us. If we take time to under, tame, take time out to understand each other. The question is, do I know who you are? Do you know who I am? Do we care about each other? Because if we do, Together, we can turn the world around. I give you Turn the World Around by Harry Belafonte, as sung by our virtual choir. <laughs> I get so energized by that song. Oh, yay. And uh, thanks to Julaine for uh, weaving our voices together so well. And so our next part of the service about Sidney Poitier is from a chapter in his book. It's called why do white folks love Sidney Poitier so? Why, you might ask. So I'm going to read from the book. 1968 was an, a time of incredible conflict and contrast. It was the year when both Martin Luther King Jr. 
and Robert F. Kennedy were assassinated. The year Lyndon Johnson succumbed to the cultural clashes over Vietnam and gave up the presidency. The year of the police riot at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. But for me personally, it was also a year of tremendous professional satisfaction. I had the number one box office success as well as numbers two and three to Sir With Love with Lulu and Ju Judy Geeson in the Heat of the Night with Rod Steiger and Lee Grant and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner with Sp Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn. And I think we did work that has more than stood the test of time. Yet given the quickly changing social currents, there was more than a little dissatisfaction rising up against me in certain corners of the black community. A cultural wave that would crest a few years later when the New York Times published an article called why do white folks love Sidney Poitier so? The issue boiled down to why I wasn't more angry and confrontational. New voices were speaking for African-Americans uh, like Stokely Carmichael, H. Rap Brown, the Black Panthers. According to a certain taste that was coming into ascendancy at the time, I was an Uncle Tom or a house Negro for playing roles that were non-threatening to white audiences, for playing the noble Negro who fulfills white liberal fantasies. In essence, I was being taken to task for playing exemplary human beings. The young engineer turned school teacher into Sir With Love. The Philadelphia homicide detective far from home in the heat of the night. And the young doctor who comes courting the daughter of Tracy and Hepburn in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. So there, these were all people who were well-spoken, intelligent, and kind. And the young doctor in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, aside from being a charming suitor, an exceedingly courteous guest and a paragon of a son had academic credentials a mile long and spent his time saving mankind for the World Health Organization. So the question being raised was, what's the message here? That black people will be accepted by white society only when they're twice as white as the most accomplished Ivy League medical graduate, that Blacks must pretend to be something they aren't, or simply that Black society does, of course, contain individuals of refinement, education, and accomplishment, and that white society, of course, should wake up to that reality. So you can guess where Sydney stood. <laughs> and here's the story of how I was taken to Miss Hepburn's house so she could check me out. When I arrived at her door and that door opened, she looked at me and didn't say a word and didn't crack a smile. But that was her MO. After the longest while, she said, hello, Mr. Poitier. And I said, hello, Miss Hepburn. And the conversation began. I could tell that I was being sized up every time I spoke, every response I made. I could imagine a plus and minus column notations in her mind, 
that's how big a step this was for her, at least to my mind. After that first meeting, uh, I went to uh, Spencer Tracy's house for a little dinner party with the two of them and some other guests. This time, Miss Hepburn was much more natural and at ease, but it was still obvious that I was under close observation by both of them. The truth of the matter is that the formation of this business relationship was almost a liter literal pre-enactment of the theme in the film we were about to make. The black man was coming for dinner and we didn't usually do that. Now, mind you, these were good, enlightened, liberal people. These were major Hollywood stars putting their ideals to the test. But even for them, the fact still remained that we don't usually do that. They were going to enter into an intense creative partnership with a black man, a partnership in which they would take on one of the primal taboos of our culture, interracial marriage. And we don't usually do that either. Should I have felt condescended to by all the scrutiny from Tracy and Hepburn? Should I have been angry and confrontational? After all, they'd had ample opportunity to know my work. At that time, I had made over 30 films and had won the Oscar for Best Actor a few years earlier. If I had been Paul Newman that they were going to do a movie with, would they have checked me out so thoroughly? But the fact of the matter is, I'm not Paul Newman. If Paul had played the part of the young doctor coming to marry their daughter, there would have been no drama. Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn were exceedingly decent people. And I think their politics were sound, but I still think asking them to be any more liberated in the America that we knew at that time would have been expecting a hell of a lot too much. So I gave them the benefit of the doubt. I looked at them as ordinary decent folks. And in fact, they turned out to be that and a hell of a lot more. But they were anxious early on for good reason. And they simply had to find out about me. As for my part in all this, I can, all I can say is that there's a place for people who are angry and defiant and sometimes they serve a purpose, but that's never been my role. And I have to say too, that I have great respect for the kinds of people who are able to recycle their anger and to put it to different uses. On the other hand, even Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi who certainly didn't appear angry when they burst upon the world, would never have burst upon the world in the first place if they hadn't at one time in their lives gone through much, much anger and much, much resentment and much, much anguish. Anguish and pain and rage are very human forces. They can be found in the breasts of most human beings at one time or another. On very rare occasions, there comes a Gandhi, and occasionally there comes a Martin Luther King Jr., and occasionally there comes a guy like Paul Robeson or a guy like Nelson Mandela. When these people come along, 
their anger, their rage, their resentment, their frustration. These feelings ultimately nurture, mature by will of their own discipline into a positive energy. But they had some mechanism, some strength, some discipline, some vision that allowed them to convert that anger into fuel. Anger is negative energy, a destructive force, but they converted it into a fuel, into positive energy. Their transformed anger fueled them in positive ways. <clears throat> well, I certainly don't live this ideal every day, but I believe it with my whole being. For me personally, the emotional center of the film in the heat of the night was another scene, one in which Chief Gillespie, the sheriff, and Detective Tibbs, that was Sidney Poitier, drove past a field of cotton. A beleaguered looking crew of field hands dragging their cotton sacks between the rows. Gillespie turned to me and said, in effect, none of that for you, huh? But the camera recorded my face as I observed these people. For me, the actor, as I watched these black men and women picking cotton, my thought was that I knew I was on the right track with the kinds of parts I had been insisting on. But the true progress it represented didn't come from unbridled rage any more than it came from polite submission. Progress then and now comes from the collision of powerful forces within the hearts of those who strive for it. Anger and charity, love and hate, pride and shame, broken down and reassembled in an igneous process that yields a firm resolve. And now we have a reading that Tina Feindel will share. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, this reading was written by Paul Robeson, uh, who was a good friend of Sidney Poitier's. And we dedicate this to the people of Ukraine. I shall take my voice wherever there are those who want to hear the melody of freedom or the words that might inspire hope and courage in the face of despair and fear. My weapons are peaceful, for it is only by peace that peace can be attained. The song of freedom must prevail. Paul Robeson. Thank you, Tina, for those words. The next part of what we are sharing about Sidney Poitier is from a chapter called Stargazing. And we'll start with a story of gazing at the stars. 
Sidney Poitier had, uh, through social connections, become friends with someone I'm sure you're all familiar with, Carl Sagan, the astronomer, the incredible uh, uh, Carl Sagan, billions and billions of stars. <clears throat> so uh, Poitier got invited to dinner and then to the lab where Carl Sagan was going to uh, make comments on the return of data from the probe of Neptune. And uh, he was just so amazed by uh, Carl Sagan's knowledge. He was a great scientist and by his ongoing curiosity, which he carried with him his whole life. And um, he, he loved being there to, to watch the stars and the information coming in. Um, so here he says that they, um, they watched that information coming in. And uh, Carl, these are uh, Sydney's words. Carl was a scientist to the end. He let it be known that his faith was firmly in science, that he believed science would eventually explain much, much more than we know now, and that those forthcoming technical details would be the only answers we're ever going to have. In other words, he wasn't looking for a hedge in his time of need as he was nearing the end of his life. He wasn't covering his bets. Well, I'm no scientist, and certainly I don't have Carl Sagan's technical understanding of the universe and our position within it. I simply believe that there's a very organic, immeasurable consciousness of which we're a part. I believe that this consciousness is a force so powerful that I'm incapable of comprehending its power through the puny instrument of my human mind. And yet I believe that this consciousness is so unimaginably calibrated in its sensitivity that not one leaf falls in the deepest of forests on the darkest of nights unnoticed. Now, given the immensity of this immeasurable power that I'm talking about, and given its pervasiveness through the universe, extending from the distant galaxies to the tip of my nose. I choose not to engage in what I consider to be the useless effort of giving it a name and by naming it, suggesting that I in any way understand it. Though I'm enriched by the language and imagery of both traditional Christianity and old island culture. Many of my human fellow human beings do give it a name and do purport to understand it in a more precise way than I would ever attempt. I just give it respect. And I think of it as living in me as well as everywhere else. I'll say that I believe in God if you press me to the wall, but then I'm going to come right back at you and give you the above definition of God. You follow? And that's the only definition of God that I'll defend because I don't think it's possible for me to embrace any other. I have a kind of respect a worshipful attitude even for nature and the natural order and the cosmos and the seasons. I know it is no accident that ancient people 
celebrated the solstice and the equinox. There's something very powerful that happens, especially in the colder climates of the North, when instead of being a minute shorter every day, daylight lasts a minute longer. You feel it in your bones. You know it as you might know the presence of God. We're halfway there. We may survive the winter after all. I don't believe in a Moses laying down the law. I simply believe that there are natural harmonies and that some things work better than others. And it so happens that most of these things that work better than others align pretty well with the Judeo-Christian ethics that most people in this country define as morality. They work better within the system of life on this planet. They don't violate the natural order. The whole process of survival tells us that there's a morality to these natural rhythms and that this morality is woven into the fabric of nature. For humanity, part of that fabric is the higher consciousness I was speaking of earlier. I feel that to aspire to that consciousness is to align ourselves with the natural order. And in essence, to let go of the self. Well, I want to um, talk, uh, share with you um, how Sydney shares a study that scientists did some years ago on baby chimpanzees. It's a very sad story. They wanted to find out if chimp, baby chimps really needed their mothers or if wire mothers would suffice to replace real mothers. So they had wire mothers with a little fur on them nipples with uh, baby bottles and a, a little arm-like structure they could rest on. So what happened to these baby chimps with wire mothers? They all withered and died. In Sydney's words, my fear is this. I fear that as we cover more of our planet with concrete and steel, as we wire our homes with more and more fiber optic cables that take the place of more intimate interactions, as we, we give our children more and more stuff and less and less time as we go further and further away from the kind of simplicity that I knew as a child on Cat Island, our Earth, Gaia, will become for us the wire mother and our souls will wither and die. So, as I said a moment ago, I feel that to aspire to higher consciousness is to al align ourselves with the natural order. When we do this, when we rid ourselves of the petty ego drives that get in our way, we find ourselves much more in tune with the natural harmony and good things can happen.
And in a moment, Julaine will share our next hymn. I invite you to sing along, just rock it out. The words are very simple, repeating amen, amen, which you may remember from the film, Lilies of the Field. So sing along with your whole heart and being. <laughs> 